Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome to the Fanalytics Podcast. This is not a regular episode of the podcast. This is, in fact, class two, and that makes me a little bit excited. Um, and so I am joined by Jay Busby. Uh, you know, Jay, I meant to look up the exact name of our class. It is called Storytelling and Analytics. <laughs> and I got distracted and didn't look that up. But this I, I can't decide if I should call this an episode or a class, but this class is going to, you know, predominantly be about the topic of storytelling. I don't know, the art, the science of storytelling, the mechanics of storytelling. And so I'm going to look up that exact title of our class as soon as I get you rolling on this. Well, I will, you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll save you the trouble. I've got it right here. I just happen to have it in front of me here. It is Storytelling and Analytics creating and managing digital cultural content. So here's what I think we need to do. I think we need to put Harry Potter and in front of that, and then it will be the best-selling college and university class we've ever seen. So everybody's going to want to sign up for it if we do that. Copyright violations, screw it. And we will have the logo be live GIFs or GIFs of kids, <laughs> perhaps, right? I'm Team Hard G, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, Jay, so... Like I said, this is class two. And so, you know, it's an interesting – look, I think this is an interesting experiment we're doing. We're, we're trying to sort of teach a class as a conversation. Right. Now, this is going to be very much a one-sided conversation today. So I'm going to start with the most general question, and that's – you know, it's almost like, you know, maybe someone sits down next to you on an airplane or they, they start to talk you – chat you up in a line, you know – what do you do, right? And, and what do you do and how does that get to this general topic of storytelling? Yeah, it's the kind of thing where you, you want to share what brought you to this point and, and uh, what makes this class interesting. So let's, you know, let's, let's, let's do it. We're, we're sitting down at, a, at an airplane. We're sitting in an airport bar. We're waiting for our plane. This is the story. Uh, I write for Yahoo Sports. I've written for Yahoo Sports since, since 2008. And I've been a storyteller, as pretentious as that sounds, uh, for much, much, much longer. Uh, the, the, the kind of old chestnut story that I tell is that when I was something like around five to six years old, um, I lost a tooth and I wrote a big, long, detailed letter to the tooth fairy with all kinds of evidence on why I should get the money and get my tooth. And the tooth fairy bought it. The tooth fairy left my tooth along with, you know, a quarter or whatever it was. So I was like, hey, this, this works, and, and that is the, the metaphor of how I realized the power of the written word. Now, um, the trick, obviously, is that at this point in our cultural and media history, the w written word is, is diminishing in impact uh, but in, in favor of other storytelling media, but that's what we're going to be talking about, uh, is the way that storytelling itself as an endeavor persists across all media. My specialty, obviously, is, is text, but then I also have an awareness of how it works across other media. So just to break it down, um, I, I work, I've been working for Yahoo, like I say, since 2008. I started out writing uh, NASCAR and golf, of all things. They had me writing blog posts on, on NASCAR and golf, and I've since diversified beyond that, uh, well beyond those two rather niche sports. But uh, I think that, that what keeps me interested every single day is – the opportunity to tell a new story, to reach people, to connect people. And I think that, again, it, it starts to get into touchy-feely stuff, but the ability to reach someone on the other side of the country, on the other side of the world, and make them feel what you want them to feel, to influence them to feel the way that you want to feel about a given subject, or at least to give them a reaction. You don't necessarily need them to agree with you. You just want them to have some sort of reaction to what you have written uh, that's a powerful feeling, and that's something that I like to hold on to, and that's what I hope to bring to this class is an understanding of how to do that, of how to go beyond just hitting the marks in, in your description and to, and to dig a little deeper and figure out what the story is that you're trying to tell whatever endeavor that you might be in. Okay, so I think that is a – look, I think this is a powerful idea that's just about everywhere, right? This idea that we – I don't know, we, we learn in stories, we remember in stories. Uh, I thought it was interesting that you mentioned the idea that you that you at least think about what you want them to feel, um, you know, from the story. So I, I don't know. And again, you know, you, you take the lead, and so you feel free to yeah. disregard my my prompt here. <laughs> but you know, does it make sense to sort of talk about the mechanics of how you put this together, the the process, uh, or 
more almost like a linear flow of like the idea generation through the process? What? Well, let's talk both. I mean, you know, the the way that uh, the way that I work, and I'm going to talk specifically now about the way that that I work in a sports writing context. And then once we get into the class, once the class listens to this and 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 makes it all the way through to the end of the episode, uh, and then we have our actual live discussions in January, then we can kind of take it in another direction and figure out how to apply it to each student's individual circumstance. But basically, let me give you an example. Uh, as I'm recording this, you'll know the outcome of this when you when you hear this when the class happens. But as I'm recording this, I'm preparing to cover the, the Peach Bowl, the college football semifinal with uh, Georgia and Ohio State. And obviously, Georgia is a favorite. Ohio State is no pushover. We don't know how that's going to work work out, but there's a number of different elements that you can look at in terms of that. Uh, you can look at the purely at the, at the statistics, at the, how they match up statistically, you know, uh, passing offense versus uh, secondary defense, or you can look at the coaching staffs, how how well, how experienced the coaching staff of Georgia is with a national championship under the belt versus Ohio State, which is a little bit less experienced on the national level as a, as a staff. Uh, you can look at the traditions of the two schools. You can look at the individual players involved. You can look at so many different elements of it. And so that's what I try to do is look beyond just the numbers and see who are the interesting players here. I mean, they're all interesting in their own way. I don't want to be diminishing, but on a national scale, who are the most interesting players? What are the most interesting storylines? What do we want to be focusing on in a story like this? So what I will do, I'm going to I'm going to segue from this now into the into what I do for my pre writing, which is is preparing to write before you actually start writing. I'm going to break this down into three sections, and I'll stop between each three mics so you can you can redirect me if I get going too far off the beam. But when you when I am pre writing, there's a few things that I keep in mind. Uh, the number one thing is to have an angle in mind, but don't be afraid to change it. When I go to this game. Uh, for me, it's it's in the future. For you listening, it's in the past. Uh, when I go to this game, I have an angle in mind. I have a couple of ideas in mind. If Georgia wins this game, this sets them up for the championship, and it it uh, sets them up to be a dynasty in co a college football dynasty. If Ohio State wins this game, it's an upset. It sets up uh, Ohio State as perhaps rising up to the level of a Georgia or an Alabama once again. Uh, if it's a close game, that means one thing. If it's, a, if it's a blowout in either direction, that means another thing. So I have some angles in mind. I'm prepared before I get there, but I'm not locked into them. You see a lot of times where someone will go, and this has happened to me pl plenty of times, uh, where I've gone and written a complete story, and it turns out the much better story is, is in a completely different location. Most often this happens when – I think that a, a given player is going to be significant and it turns out that he or she is not significant. Or the worst thing that can happen is if I if I write a good portion of my story, this has happened sadly quite a few times, I'll write the story and I will be, uh, it'll be halftime and I'm thinking, ah, this is a blowout. I can start uh, putting it putting it away here, putting it to bed. And then all of a sudden, you know what happens next. There's a, the, the other team surges back and I've got to tear up everything that I've written and, uh, and not, and not uh, touch any of that. But the idea is to have to be prepared, but not be locked in. Uh, and, and along with that, there are times when I certainly feel tempted to write the story or write the, the bulk of the story before the game even happens. You know, I could I could write a chunk of, of this particular game before the game even happens, but if I start expecting that, say, Georgia is going to blow out Ohio State or that Ohio State is going to put up a good battle, then that's where I run into trouble because it never is going to work out precisely the way that you expect it to. It's, it's, you know, the old line about plans, not surviving the first contact with the enemy. Once you have your plan in mind for writing, you've got to be able to be flexible and understand that, that events will change. And as soon as, as soon as somebody outside of your own skull starts looking at what you've written, or as soon as circumstances outside of, of what you have envisioned in your mind start unfolding, it turns out to be a whole lot different than uh, what you had expected and what you planned for. So you don't want to get locked in. And then another element of what I do is try to be aware of all sides of a story. And, and the way that I frame this uh, in my case is talk to the backup quarterback. And, and what that means you know, in this context is when I'm writing a story, if I were writing a story about, uh, for instance, one that I'm going to be writing in the next few weeks is Tom Brady's final regular season game. He's going to be in Atlanta 
Uh, he's going to be playing the Falcons, and uh, I'm going to be writing a story on his final regular season game. Who knows? It might be his final game of his career. There's, there's a chance that could happen. But one way or another, it's going to be a significant game on January 8th against the Falcons. When you're writing a story like that, you're not going to get a one-on-one with Tom Brady. You're not going to be able to sit down and say, hey, Tom, you know, let's, let's have a little half-hour conversation about your life and career. It's just not going to happen. So you've got to look at it in a slightly different way. You've got to come at it from a different angle. And the way that I phrase it here is talk to the backup quarterback because whoever is not uh, – who the, the star is out of reach, but the people next to the star, the people who know everything that the star knows, the quarterback who's been there with the star – He's often very much in reach. You can go and sit down and you can talk to him, and he knows everything that the star knows. He's been there through the entire season alongside the star, but he's not as unreachable. So it's all about looking for ways to get the information that you need without necessarily uh, having to just bang your head against the wall or be there in a crowd of other people following in, in the same lockstep with everybody else. There's a lot of different ways to get the information that you need. And uh, the the worst way to do it is just to follow in line with everybody else. So that's kind of the preparation that I do before my, before I write. And then the actual, we can talk a little bit about the, the nuts and bolts of, of the actual creation, which applies not just for text, but for any sort of creation of any story uh, next. But let me, let me kick it back to you and get a drink and, uh, while you redirect it. <laughs> Okay, so right off the top, how much of your uh, how much of the process is the pre work? Uh, a lot. Um, if if it's a football game, I'll put in several days of pre work, um, and if it's, it depends. If it's, if it's a game, then that's that's a little bit of preparation. If it's if it's a feature story, if it's a book, it's tremendous amounts of pre work. That's that's weeks and months of pre work of trying to reach out to people, of trying to, before you even start the writing process uh, of all of that. So you, the more prepared you are, the better off that you are. The more that you know everything about your subject, the better off you are. I've got, I think it's, it might be in camera view, it might not. The the, the Earnhardt book that I wrote on, on Dale Earnhardt and his family in both directions. Um, I spent years literally researching that book, digging into all kinds of files, talking to all kinds of people. I spent months and months before I even typed the first word doing all kinds of research. So the, the preparation, the more prepared that you are, the moment that you actually start writing, the easier that it becomes to do. Okay. The other thing I'm hearing from this, and I wonder if this is sort of unique to sports, maybe it's unique to, maybe there's a few other things like politics. I guess you've got this massive random variable um, that, that occurs, right? And so a lot of what I'm hearing is a need to be adaptive. Do you think that's unique to sports journalism or is that, you know, more sort of more of a general kind of concept? I think it's, at this point, it's a general concept for everybody, isn't it? I mean, I think that, that the ability to understand that circumstances can change in a hurry um, and, and you'd better be able to be flexible uh, – then I think that that's that's tremendously helpful for anyone in this that's working in a 2022 environment to to be able to understand because so much changes so fast whether it's uh, the news and events on the ground or whether it's the the platforms that you use to to either distribute or consume that news you've got to be able to to look from a variety of angles at something. And you've got to be able to understand that sometimes you have to change your angle and your approach if it's not working. So I think that the worst thing that you can get stuck in is, is a rut where you're just looking at the same sources of new, for news, looking, at, looking for the same sources for information, trying to find the same sources for your stories, trying to take the same approaches to stories and to storytelling. Because if you're bored of it, your audience is going to get bored of it. If you're tired of telling a story, it's going to show through in your work. And so that's why you always want, it's, it's tough to do, you know, it's tough to, to be constantly innovative. It's tough to constantly stay on the, the, the bleeding edge of culture or whatever it might be, but I think it's necessary to, to at least try. Okay. The other word that I, that popped in my head was this idea of when you're talking to the backup quarterback, this strike me as um, almost uh, so maybe there's this desire to differentiate but when you differentiate, you know, when you when you're making something different, right? You're going a little bit opposite the mainstream. 
you can often fall into the a situation where you're pursuing a niche yes. audience, right? Yeah, that's an excellent point. I mean, I could go and write a story now about, uh, oh, let's just say, a, you know, someone who lives in the hills of West Virginia and he carves his own kayaks and he rides those kayaks <laughs> down a remote river and, he, and it turns out that his kayaks that he's hewn out of you know, out of pine or whatever are, are the most amazing kayaks ever created by man. And, and it might be an interesting story to some people, but most people are going to be like, eh, so what the guys create carbon kayaks in West Virginia. I just don't care. It's and, and your, your niche. And obviously you can find the essential truths in that story, but uh, it's, you, you've got to work a little harder or to bring it to a more realistic example, you know, there have been times, and I'm not going to name any names or even any sports, where I've been talking to people and I'm just like, you are not giving me anything. There is nothing I am getting out of this conversation you know, because they, they, they know that they, if, they, if they speak in cliches, if they speak in just, boy, yeah, we just got to take them one game at a time. Uh, you know, well, we would put in a good effort today. You know that – um, that there's not, you're not breaking any new ground there. And, and for some people that's deliberate for some people, they just, you know, they're, they're trying to kind of keep you at arm's length. And for some, they just, you know, they don't think of those terms. They're just, they, they're just there to play, play their sport, baseball, football, basketball, whatever it might be. So yeah, th that is the danger. If you get too far uh, down one rabbit hole, you start shedding parts of your audience as you go. And at some point it becomes unsustainable and, and not really, uh, the juice is not worth the squeeze, as the uh, as the cliche goes. Yeah, that that raises a like to me a really interesting question, but I don't want to derail you. <laughs> but I, you know, can we come back? Can we come back to the idea though? It, you know, maybe as we end this, that very often now you're trying to tell a story, but the person you're speaking to is also developing and managing their own. Yeah, brand. I mean, we can we can go. So that. they're yeah. trying. To Manipulate the stories that are told about their story. Absolutely, I mean, we can go there right now. I mean, it's yeah. it's uh, it, the students may be familiar with uh, a website called the Players Tribune, which is where athletes have gone to uh, tell their own story without the the filthy media getting in the way and screwing it up. And now, what that often means, what that's it can mean at its best, what that'll mean is that an athlete will tell a story about themselves, about their past, about their challenges, about their history that that gives them a chance to tell this story honestly and in the way that they want to tell it. More often, it's a chance for them to kind of shape the narrative, for them to plant the flag and say, this is my story. And this is, it doesn't, don't worry about what the media tells you about the fact that I was a, that I was a cancer in the locker room or the fact that I, that I got into a fight with my coach every season. I, I wasn't a difficult person. I was a driven person and no one could keep up with me. You know, it's a chance for them to shape their own narrative. So yeah, it, it, there is a bit of a, a push and pull there now where the subjects of your inquiry understand what their role is. They understand that they are that, that, that they are for their they understand that they are there for entertainment, but they also know that they have a story to tell themselves that they want told in a very specific way. And so they don't necessarily have the same need, or at least they don't believe they have the same need to tell it. Uh, to the media in the way that the, that the players have even as recently as just a, a decade or so ago. Yeah, that make, makes a lot of sense. Everyone's a brand now. <laughs> exactly. Right? Go. Exactly. Okay, so back to, I guess, the, the, the process. process. Yes, Isn't let's that? get into the process. Um, this is what I find interesting is that, you know, I, I try to – learn from, again, this sounds pretentious as hell. I'm not as pretentious as I sound, but I try to learn from craftspeople in all disciplines. You know, how, uh, I, I don't know, a guitar maker makes a guitar, how an auto mechanic learns to, to build and rebuild a car. You know, I, I, I admire craftsmanship in all its, in all its iterations. And so that's what I try to pursue to, uh, to some extent when I'm writing. And, and I have a few sorts of tips that I use. And, and I seriously think that this can be, these are the kinds of things that I hope are useful even beyond, you know, because God knows I don't want any of our students to become sports writers. I wouldn't lay that curse on them. But uh, these are the kinds of tips that, that I think that, that can be useful in that framework as well. The number one thing for me is uh, write fast. Uh, and I, I don't mean 
totally for the, the entire project, but initially write fast. You just write as fast as you can. You get everything out on the page and then you go back and edit again. You got to go back and, and edit a second time. But there was a great um, uh, explanation of this from one of the creators of The Simpsons that I heard, and I just loved it so much that when he wrote his first draft of an episode, he would just write it down point by point as fast as he possibly could. He wouldn't worry about whether it was funny. He wouldn't worry about whether it made sense. He wouldn't worry about whether Homer and Bart and Marge were saying all the the appropriate in-character things. He just wrote it down as fast as he could. So that when he went back to it the next day, he said it was like a crappy little elf had written a Simpsons episode and he had to go back and revise it. But once he had it there on the page, uh, it was so much easier to work with than to pull it out of the air. So that crappy little elf philosophy has stuck with me. But that's the kind of thing that you want to to, to do is get it down on the page. And once it's down there the first time. Uh, is that is that an, like an outline it, form it can be, or is it beyond? It can be outline? whatever it is, whatever it is for you. I mean, for some people, it's an outline. For some people, it's it, for me, I write into just slabs of text, you know, and I will write a paragraph, I'll write three or four sentences, and then I'll go to the next chunk. And and I, it's just literally like throwing paragraphs on the page. But some people work best with outlines, which is great. I think that the main thing to do is just turn off that internal editor in your head because we all have one, all that voice that, you know, you, you write something and that voice in your head goes, yeah, that sucks. That's, that's terrible. That's, everybody's going to laugh at you for that one. You just turn that off for the time that you you're getting through your first draft. You just put it down on the page and then you go back and get it pretty. But um, yeah, I don't generally work with outlines. I generally work with just throwing big chunks of text on the page but uh, but whatever works for people. Some people have that that more formalistic structure, and and if it works for them, great. It's just a matter of figuring out what works for you. Once you have that on the page, there's another little line uh, that's that that goes like this, which I don't endorse. I'm not I'm not endorsing this. I'm saying it's just a line. Write drunk, edit sober, which means basically write without worrying about a damn thing. You do not have to literally write drunk. Some people do doesn't work for me, may not work for you, but you basically write without worrying about what it's going to sound like. And then you edit, you go back and you take a closer look at it with a sober mind, with a calm mind, with an understanding that, okay, this up here that I introduce has to pay off down here. This has to have evidence behind it. This question right here is left unresolved. That's the kind of stuff that you figure out once you've, you've had some time to reflect on it and you're not in the middle of creation. Now, all of this obviously necessitates getting started on it early. You, uh, you don't always have the luxury of doing this. Sometimes when you're on a deadline, you only have a few minutes to do something like this. But this is if you have a project that that you have a little bit of time to work on. And yes, go does, ahead. Sorry, does this um, is this is this the general process? If it's a hundred and fifty book, a hundred and fifty page book versus. 1500 word yes. essay. I mean, generally, that's generally how I do it. I mean, I'm, I'm working on a story right now uh, on an Ohio State player, which will be long out and long lost to the mists of internet uh, history once this, this class comes out. But yeah, it's, it's going to be about 1500 words. And I throw the, the pieces of the, the paragraphs on the page and then go back and, and sort them out. And, you know, I, I figure out where the holes are and then I fill them in that way. And same thing for a book. If you're on a tight deadline, that's where it gets a little bit trickier. That's where your your repetitions come into play. You, you don't have the time to sit there and, and, and be all flowery with your language and try to come up with uh, cute metaphors and all that stuff. You just got to get the story out as fast as possible. Um, one thing that just, just so that just a little bit of behind the scenes work here, what we do is – Back in the olden days, by which I mean the pre-internet days, um, uh, a writer could absorb what's happening in an event. The event would finish, and then if it was the the daily paper, they'd have a few hours to do it. Uh, if it was, say, Sports Illustrated, they, ha- they would have several days or up to a week to do it, to, to write what they wanted to write, to dig into detail, and to, and to give a full, expansive picture. Now, uh, if you want to have something, a, an article written on a story, that on a game that happens – your article needs to be done within about 90 seconds, if, if not sooner, of the, the clock hitting zero, the last out being made, the last putt falling in the cup. Because if people can't find it on your site, they will find it somewhere else. And so you need to have at least something ready when that final, uh, the final bell sounds 
So, so what we will do a lot of times is we will have something written and then we will push it live and then we'll go back and, and add more later on. But, uh, you know, there have been plenty of times where I've, I've gone and had my editors finish off a story because I'm already downstairs trying to find out what's happening in the locker room or what have you. But we, we have to have it done uh, at the moment that the game is over. Uh, for for search engine reasons, and you can't afford to wait around and and wait for inspiration to strike. You need to go ahead and just knock it out that way. We can wrap up with the the way that that I handle the the after writing, you know, or the the second draft of writing. And one thing that I like to do is make sure that I am taking the reader there. And this again, this this does not necessarily apply to directly to what. Um, students may be doing, but, but in a way, depending on the podcast, it might, um, I want to, I want the reader to see something in my writing that they would not have otherwise seen that they can't see on television that they wouldn't have heard with, uh, with a, uh, post game interview. I want them to see what happens in the hallways, you know, outside the locker room after the game, I want them to feel what it feels like in a locker room that has just won or has just lost uh, a championship. I want them to to see these little bits of humanity that show you who these players are once they have have reached this this pinnacle moment of their lives. And that's the trick: is bring them bring the reader something that they haven't seen before, something familiar yet new. And that's that's a that's a tough thing to do. I mean, it's that was the trickiest part about writing during uh, the pandemic was we were all looking at the same thing. We were all looking at the same TV and we were all seeing the same broadcast. What do we do to, to bring somebody something different? So whether it's, it's uh, something that's actually physically happening or it's some level of analysis that you bring, some sort of, of additional analysis that you bring in or some sort of outside source, an individual that you can bring in, something to give the reader something that they didn't already have and that they couldn't get for themselves. Because your readers, your customers, whoever it may be, they're pretty smart. At this point, they in, in 2022, 2023, they are extremely media literate. They, they are smart. They know when they're being conned. They know when they're being fed something that is, that, that is the same old, same old for them. So you've got to bring them something new that they have not already seen before. That's kind of the guiding philosophy here in, in putting, uh, making an article, raising it just from pushing it out the door to raising it to something higher than that. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about what to do after the first round of creation and, uh, and what happens. And one thing that I do as best I can is to let it cool. And what that means is just you step away from it for a bit. And and sometimes when I'm writing, you know, if I'm writing in a press box, I will literally stand up and I'll walk away. I'll take a circuit around, even walk down to the field, something like that, just to give my brain a chance to step away from it. Because it's amazing what your creative mind will do. And I'm not talking about just writers. I'm talking about anybody. What your creative mind will do if you give it a chance to just cool off and then start working behind the scenes, start making connections that you didn't see, start making connections that you didn't expect. And that only happens if you kind of, it's like any kind of workout. You need to have time to, to rest and recover. So that's one of the things that I do uh, to try to do that, to try to, to try to make those connections and to try to make the, the story more than it was originally. And then down the line, there's a couple of things to, to be aware of. And then, and this always leads into a fun area of discussion. Uh, the first thing is, is learning from it. You know, you, I, I always, after I publish something, I will go back uh, a week or so later and I'll take a look at it and I'll see, all right, this made sense. Ah, this, I could have done a little better. I, you know, this, this phrase, I was working a little too hard here. This, Hey, I think I, I think I got a hit there. I think that works. You, you go back and you look at your, your own reading with kind of an honest, your own writing with an honest eye and you assess what worked and what didn't work. And this doesn't have to be in public. This is just something, you know, that you do inside your head and you understand what's better and what's worse and what you can learn from it the next time. And then the flip side of that is to understand that if you are putting something out in the world, the world is going to respond to it. And this is where it always gets fun. Uh, this is where you have to be aware that it is not you. It is not your soul that you're putting out into the world. It is your work. No matter what you write, whether it's a 
story about a Georgia Ohio State game, or it's a recollection of the time that your that your puppy passed away. You know, it's and it's straight from your heart. It's it's not you. It is your work, and I get criticism all the time of the stuff that I write. I get praise, but also get criticism. And and as we all know, uh, you could hear good job from from twenty people, and if the one person says, "Hey, that sucks," which one is going to stick with you? It's, the, it's that one person. So uh, so the main thing to remember is when you are creating, you are creating a work, and that work is separate from you. And 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 so that means whether it's 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 us grading your work or whether it's somebody analyzing your work from the outside. You've got to keep your your yourself separate from that, and that's something that's tough to do, particularly when people are saying, uh, you know, you should stop writing and go, you should go jump in front of a bus so that no one ever has to read your writing again. Uh, but it it is it is just your work. It's not who you are as a person, and so that's always a good thing to remember and and to just kind of dust your hands off and, and move on to the next one. But uh, that's always fun for people to hear about is the the ridiculous things that uh, that America has to say about about my work and any of our work once they've they've gotten a good look at it and so it's it's a matter of just keeping in mind that it's it's not who you are it's it's just something that you should let people read okay so I, you know that was that was on one of my lists to ask about how you incorporate and use feedback now you know and, <laughs> and look Jay as you're going over that I mean I just have to laugh in a way right when you say you get some praise and you get some hate. <laughs> I was thinking praise. <laughs> What's the praise? I, uh, I, I mean, so you, you are you you literally still? And I don't look. I don't even know if they these you know comment boards seem to be something that have disappeared largely yeah. over the last few years. I mean, are you you're reading the public reaction? Because the other thought that occurred yes. to me is thick yes. skin is something you got to have. Yeah, when you're I don't. We still have comments beneath our articles. I generally, I'll take a look at them. Here's what I want to look. Here's what I want to know from comments. Did I screw something up really badly? And and this has happened. I've never had a, a situation where I've really made a kind of catastrophic screw up. You know, knock on all the wood in the world. But I have had situations where I have, uh, I don't know, misspelled someone's name, or I have had a year wrong in which. Florida beat Tennessee, or I've had a, I have misidentified a player or something like that. And, or I've misremembered a play. And that's the kind of stuff where people will tell you in no uncertain terms, you know, Hey, dumbass, it, it was Tim Tebow. That was a quarterback then not, not so-and-so. And so you, but they're not polite about it, but they're also correct. You're like, ah, you know what? That was a mistake on my part. I need to go and change that. So you want to be aware of that kind of stuff. But when people are just coming at you and just savaging you, um, or when they're just ranting about whatever the subject may be, and you're just kind of the you're the messenger that they're trying to kill. You can't worry about that. Um, in one of the one of my aspects is writing a, a daily newsletter, and we do we we solicit we actively want feedback from readers, and so most of it is pretty positive. But every once in a while, you know, you'll you'll write something, and somebody will go, you know, "You're insane. You're wrong. You're horrible," and you know, it, it again, thick skin. It doesn't really bother me. It actually doesn't bother me at all. The only time when it, the only time when it really bothers me is if I know that if they hit on something that I know that I had not put in the preparation for, or that I know that I had not done the work for, or that I, an aspect that I didn't consider. Hey, did you think about this aspect? And I'm really, I realize, eh, you know what? I didn't think about that. And so that's the kind of stuff that makes me pause. But in terms of insulting me, no. Nah, I mean, I've I've heard it all, death threats, all of it. Yeah, it's it's interesting, right? The when when people become anonymous, <laughs> the tone changes and all sorts. But you know, the other thing I and I think this is an important thing. It's you know, the, when people are judging, and, and I don't think it matters. I, I agree with you. I don't think it matters what the content, whether it's a podcast or writing or a academic journal article. People are much more forgiving of themselves. You know, everyone's happy to have 98% accuracy, but readers are always going to demand oh, 105% yeah. accuracy, right? And by that, I mean that th there isn't even wiggle room for things that are a little bit, you know, questionable. Okay, um, I'm going in reverse order of some of the things that occurred to me as, as you were going through the, the process. Number two, sort of counting down, do you think in terms of keywords at all? And, and and I don't even really know that that's the right word, but sort of the thing, look, yeah. if everything's driven by an algorithm and everything is about search engine optimization, 
how does that affect how you put these things together? And yeah, it does. Does I mean, it at not, all? Not directly in terms of keywords, except for the headline. I mean, the headline. We we are constantly undergoing SEO training to understand how to put together a good headline that will catch the attention of uh, Google servers and make sure that we are ranking highly. So so there is that, but. More to the point, it's kind of there isn't a matter of construction. Um, for instance, apparently Google does not like one sentence paragraphs to lead off stories, and so you know they want us to write larger paragraphs um, to to lead off stories. And sometimes I'll I'll go along with that, and sometimes I've pushed back. You know, there was a, a scene where uh, Tiger Woods was walking across the bridge at St. Andrews this summer. And, and I wrote a, a, a series of small paragraphs because it was a moment that needed, that I thought needed to have sentences breathe. You didn't want to have this big slab of text where it said, Tiger Woods stood on the bridge and looked and blah, blah, blah. You wanted to have, you wanted to have it, it breathe a little bit more. And there was some question about whether that's, that was SEO appropriate, but you know, the, you can't be completely beholden to SEO all the time, but you do have to think about that. And you, and you can't go and write 14,000 words on, on the coverage schemes of, of Georgia against Ohio state's receivers, you know, it's just, it's, it's not going to fit. So it may not necessarily be keywords, but yes, the, the way that, that reading that writing reads on the internet is definitely a consideration. Okay. And then my last one, and maybe this is a little tough because you, you talked a lot about angles, finding the angles. In some ways, I think what we're going to ask the students to do, though we're not going to turn them yeah. down if we don't like what they come up with, is, you know, as they're generating ideas, how do they, how do you think about yeah, pitching yeah. ideas, selling I mean, ideas? There's a, there's a few ways to think about this. Um, generally, your first idea right out of the gate might be a pretty good one, but it's not going to be, it shouldn't be the only one. Um, you know, let's, let's, let's use the example. We've talked about um, the, the Taylor Swift one and, and the Taylor Swift and, and her army of Swifties and, and her war against Ticketmaster and her war against uh, her old producers and all kinds of these things. There are a number of different angles that you could take here. And the best thing to do is to kind of throw out as many as you can, not throw out, I, I, Offer up as many as you can before you start ditching them. Offer up as many ideas as you can. Just sit and brainstorm. Come up with, with a whole list of ideas with the understanding and the expectation that 90 to 95% of them are going to be thrown out. It's it's like having a conversation. You know, you and I have conversations and, and we'll start out talking about one thing and we end up talking about something completely different that we wouldn't have gotten to or wouldn't have thought about ahead of time, but you get there organically. And it's the same way with ideas. If you're brainstorming ideas, you might suddenly get to a point where you're talking about Taylor Swift's connection to whatever it might be, third world economies that, that rely on her music to... to power their engines, whatever it might be, something absurd like that. But uh, it's it's the kind of thing where as long as you're able to keep these ideas coming and not be satisfied with the first one, not say, yep, yeah, uh, we're going to do a, a podcast on Taylor Swift and that's it. We're done. We're out. You know, that's, that's not what you want to do. You want to be generating these ideas with the understanding that most of them will be thrown out. And again, that goes back to the idea that it's not you, it's your work, you know, you, but you know, you're going to spend time creating ideas and, and only one of them is going to make it through. But that's why you, that's why you spend all that time creating all those ones that didn't make it. Sounds good. Um, anything that we're missing? I, I think, you know, we want to as pre-work for the class or as sort of just general, the public general public following along, I think 45 minutes yeah. is always a good chunk. So what else have we, what have I, what have I failed to? You've failed in nothing, yeah. sir. It's been great. Uh, the, the whole idea here that I just want to get across to people is it's, it's yes, what I'm doing is for a specific subset of writing. You know, most people are not going to be writers and most writers are not sports writers, but the idea of creation and the idea of, of coming up with multiple ideas, testing these ideas, uh, workshopping these ideas and seeing what sticks that's a kind of, of, of skill and an ability that will serve you well no matter where you head after this, in academia, in quote unquote, the real world, all of it. And, and it's something that I think that we could all get a little better at is just figuring out that, that 
the more that we work to unleash that creative side of our brain, the more that we will all be stunned at what we come up with and, and in our own, in both in our own heads and in, in discussions with others. So uh, free up your mind and you will not believe what it comes up with for you. I feel like we're going to talk a lot about <laughs> pop music in this class. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Free, free yourself. Was that? And and well, um, okay. And so here is, you know, I, I think you don't want to ask questions that you have no idea what the answer is going to be, but we're going to ask these folks to do this type of creative exercise in groups. Have you ever had an experience where you're working on something like this, but in a, and not mm -hmm. even as a partner, as a group yeah. of you know, four or five, you know, create it. I guess that's creation right. Right. with a team, and right? That can sometimes be a pain and it can sometimes end up with a real watered down product. Or if you have the right approach to it, it can make, come up with a, a, a much better product. I'm part of a small team within Yahoo and we meet literally every single week. You know, we meet Mondays at 1230 and we will road test each other's ideas and we'll, we'll throw out. Uh, we, we are not necessarily all working on the same project at the same time, although we have in the past, but we are there to kind of test and probe at the weaknesses of each other's ideas. And again, this gets at the, at the, the idea that it's not you, it's your work. If somebody says, Jay, that idea is, yeah, that's kind of cliched, you know, then I'm thinking, okay, well, you know, what can I do to make that better? Or what can you offer up to make it better? Um, but yeah, it's, a collaborative environment, um, as long as you're all working to push things forward and not just working to, to tamp down everybody else, else's ideas, can be a tremendous way to really uh, to make some strong, strong creations. Perfect. Okay, I think we cut uh, it there. Unless you got a last word, Jay. And so this is class two in the books. Uh, class three will be. Uh, similar in structure, a conversation, but on the analytical or the analytics, uh, sort of the data side to the content creation, distribution, management of a cultural product as a business. We're going to be switching hats here. I will be asking the questions and you're going to be the one soliloquizing for uh, 42 <laughs> minutes and 18 seconds or whatever it might be. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, guys, thanks. And uh, well, wait till the next class.